Hello, so this afternoon I'm joined by Mike Fisher from the English Whiskey Company. Welcome, Mike. Thanks very much for coming and chatting to me. No problem, Richard. No problem at all. Now, the first thing I have to say is I really, um, I'm very jealous of the backdrop that you've got behind you there. And um, that's a rather impressive uh, workspace that you're, you're beaming from uh, today. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's just an occupational hazard. Uh, just <laughs> the, I think 90% of the bottles there are all open. And it's just, I don't know, from doing lots and lots of tastings and obviously lots and lots of years in whiskey at the end of the day. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I've got a bit of a, actually, I should say your, your position at uh, the English Whiskey Company, you're head of, of global sales. And uh, as someone myself who's got a bit of a background in sales, I know one of the most important things is to, is to know your product. So I can see that you're a man that's very dedicated to, to getting to know your, um, uh, you know I your product. <laughs> It's a hard job, but somebody's got to do it, haven't they? So just, just looking at the product and making sure it's just right. It's fantastic. Well, yes, I'm very, very jealous. But um, before we go into a little bit more about, um, you know, some whiskies and, and th general thoughts on, on your thoughts on certain things, maybe you could give us a little run, you know, go back through the history of the English Whiskey Company. Just a brief sketch, you know, for those that are watching or just learning about English whiskey for the first time. Because, of course, you guys really are the, are the godfathers of English whiskey. You, you guys kickstarted it all back in yeah. 2006. And, and everyone that's followed has a great uh, deal to thank you for, for, for pioneering and paving the way. So I wonder if you can give me just a little bit about the history of how the company started. Absolutely. I think really to, to have a good idea of where we started is you've got to think what the, uh, the craft spirit scene was like back in 2005, six, when we started. And there was no big boom in whiskey. There was no big boom in gin or anything like that. So craft spirits weren't really where they are now at all. So you could probably on, a, on the gin side, you could probably, Bombay Sapphire was probably the best sort of uh, gin that you could get and that sort of thing. <laughs> and and whiskey was, uh, I think a lot of it was blend. The uh, malt whiskey was, was starting to pick up from Scotland and that sort of thing. But in England, there was nothing. And there'd been nothing for about a hundred years when the Lee Valley distillery closed down, which was the last one in England. And I think a lot of people don't realize that at that point, a hundred years or so ago, there was quite a number of distilleries in England and uh, they just demised over time and that sort of thing for what, for a number of different reasons. So fast forward to 2005, six, uh, we're actually owned and we were built by a family called the Nelstrop family. And uh, it was mainly, it was uh, Andrew and his father, James, who, who built the distillery. It was James' real passion. So they were farmers in the Norfolk area where we're based and up into Lincolnshire and that sort of thing. And I think they'd been farmers for generations and, uh, and James's dad or grandfather, I can't really remember which, had always made like this little jibe within the family that it's a shame we have to, we're, we're, to get anything decent out of this barley, we have to send it off up to Scotland and, uh, and make it into whiskey. Yeah. Sort of thing. So there was always that. Was great. And I think that really resonated with James. And he was a real, really, really into whiskey. He was such a big whiskey enthusiast. And not just Scotch whiskey, he was hugely into world whiskies and that sort of thing. And he always had this dream that he would start up his own distillery, basically. And uh, which was seen as a bit of a mad thing to do. And <laughs> it was 2005, he retired and he was coming up to retirement. And when he retired, instead of him just sitting back and enjoying life, he decided, right, I'm going to build a distillery. And uh, everybody thought it was start raving mad. But the idea at the time was to start this little small distillery, I think, to scratch an itch in some sort of ways and to keep him okay. and the local area in, in whiskey, really. So he wants to build this little one, making a few barrels every year. And, uh, and then he got HMRC involved. And, uh, and then that's where it all went, well, went right, I think, <laughs> in, as opposed to wrong. <laughs> Uh, a, so at that time, uh, the smallest still that you're allowed was 1800 litres, which is a big still. So it's a decent yeah. size still. And, uh, and that's your smallest bit of kit is your spirit still. Then you've got to have a bigger wash still, bigger mash tun, etc. So his idea from going from a place making a few barrels a year to a thing that at minimum had to be making a few barrels a day really is, is a completely different kettle of fish. And instead of him running away from it, he decided, oh, sorry, no, I'm going to 
I'm going to push on. And uh, I think it was his he a great determination and passion, which is the thing that built the entire thing. And he just took his own money, no outside investors or anything like that. And he plowed it into building this distillery. And if you think with Costa was no gin or anything like that at the time, and also because, J because James was very, very dead set on, we're building a distillery to make the best whiskey we possibly can. That it was going to be 100% a whiskey distillery at that time and that's it. And uh, so he put his, his money where his mouth was. And if you think, if you went to a bank with a, with a whiskey distillery business plan and said, right, I want to borrow some money to, to build this thing and then we'll make stuff and we'll employ people for three or four years and we won't sell anything. And then we'll get to a point in three or four years' time where we might be able to sell something. I think they'd just chuck yeah. you out and laugh at you, wouldn't they? <laughs> uh, it was seen as start raving mad and in some, some quarters. But it went ahead and we ended up with the distillery we've got today. So he also was really, really good at, uh, I don't know, seeming to get people on board in some sort of way. So uh, when we first started, he brought along uh, Ian Henderson, who had been the long-time distiller of Laphroaig up in Scotland, and he'd just retired, and he brought him uh, on board to about six months or so and just helped us get to a place where we could design the stills, so uh, where we wanted to get the spirit character and that sort of thing. So, uh, And then, then we started in 2006, really. Oh, amazing. And, and I've, um, I managed to get, because one thing I want to do is I want to collect a lot of the first releases from all the English whiskey distilleries. And, and I do have, I do have one of those ones right there, which uh, from uh, the English whiskey company, which is, um, I'm quite happy. And, and this is, uh, yeah, this has got a little note in there from James, actually, which is quite nice. So it's, uh, right. I, think, I can't remember mm. how many of those were released, but it's got a little, uh, little label in there. What do you think um, James would have made of um, all of that work that uh, you know went in and, and all of the obstacles that he had to overcome to be the first English whiskey distillery in, in over 100 years? What do you think he would have sort of thought now that we were at the stage of around 25 and, and there's certainly three or four that I know that are kind of either hoping to start making whiskey or they're already in, 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 um, in, in the early stages of that. What would he have make, of all, make of all of that now? I think he'd have found it quite funny in some respects. Uh, I think just <laughs> the fact that so many people had jumped in on it, really. And yeah. but also, I think I think he'd have I think he'd have been quietly proud, really. I think yeah. that's the, that's the thing. I think just just quite 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 quietly proud of himself and just of what he'd built. And uh, that obviously, it's sort of I don't know where English whiskey would be today, if if it wasn't for James and Andrew setting up the distillery, because yeah. I think it was them gave other people the confidence to to jump into it really. Absolutely and I had a, an interesting conversation a few weeks back with um, with Darren Rook from previously of the London Distillery Company um, and it, where you talk about still size you know and, and having to be 1800 litres back when when you guys started and then now now because of the work that, that James did and then some of the other things that smaller distilleries did to push through the still size as long as it could be commercially viable they could so you've even got ones like I know Ludlow um, who I think he's got a 200 litre uh, still which is yeah. which is incredible isn't it really just making a couple of barrels of you know, three or four barrels a year which is which is which is amazing I think it was um, I think it was uh, Sipsmiths who actually finally got it uh, did the petitioning and everything to actually get oh, that yeah. changed and that was about three or four years after we after we started and oh. i think luckily we started when we did and we ended up with something that was bigger so that's actually seen as quite well and been quite fortuitous because obviously then going forward as demand has increased considerably Absolutely. we've uh, we've been able to keep up with that really well, that, that's a very good point because um, a lot of the smaller English whiskey distilleries that have now been able to start up um, because of the reduction in, in the still sizes are facing that exact problem now. You, excuse me, you guys, because you've got larger stills, can you know can can supply that demand but some of the smaller guys they are fi finding now that okay we've been quite successful we need to up our stills but that's going to be a lot of investment or maybe we need to move to new premises you know so it's uh, i think, it's, I, think I think on that on that part really i think a lot of it is maybe not so much the stills for us it's uh, it's that we're a family owned business we don't have to pander to any shareholders or or yeah. or investors in sort of any sort of way and they've always had an eye on the future long-term future and not just like a three-year business plan or anything like that it's like long long term 
And I think that's what you've got to have in whiskey. So we've always overproduced just to be able to have that stock security going forward. If you've got 10 casks and you sell eight of them today, then you've only got two left that can go on further on. So we've mm. always overproduced because you can only sell that cask once. And if you've sold it at three years old, you can't sell it at eight years old or 10 years old or even 50 years old or whatever it might yeah. be. Very true. Now, you mentioned that Ian Henderson, you know, helping start the, you know, get things running in the distillery and mentoring and, and tutoring. And I understand um, that's where your head does. Do, do you call um, David your head distiller or master distiller? What's your kind of? Call David an awful lot of things, but usually just David, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would say distiller. Yeah. Distiller. So, so, um, so David Fit there is, yeah, your, your head distiller and, and, um, and I guess he and I, I read somewhere that he was kind of mentored and tutored because does he come from a um, like a brewing background? And he then was, yeah. was, so was he tutored. joined us at the time when we started, uh, but yeah. he actually it was his first distilling job and obviously still is his first distilling job. Uh, yeah. But he was a brewer. It was a it was a, a master brewer or brewer of some sort at Green King, which is at Bury St Edmunds, not so not so far away from the distillery. So he actually yeah. came and he worked with Ian for uh, for a number of months and basically worked underneath him if you think about the production of of whiskey really of spirit then as a brewer is already halfway there really and i think yeah. there's an awful lot of the time not so much i don't think in whiskey so much but in a lot of other spirits that people forget about the fermentation and getting yeah. all them esters into the into the fermentation and into the wort is really, really important. And that then flavors yeah. pull all the way through. So the brewing side of distilling, I think is as important as the distilling side of it, if not more so, to be honest. Absolutely. I think I, I saw, I remember reading in a book somewhere where it said, you know, whiskey is what beer wants to be when it grows up. You know, it's, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it is, it's, exactly. And talking about David, um, I had a conversation a couple of weeks back with Billy Abbott from the Whiskey Exchange, and he named David as uh, one of the best distillers in the United Kingdom, um, of course, including Scotland, which which is um, which is pretty an impressive accolade. And I know David has won quite a few awards, you know. So, mm. what, in your opinion, is it that makes him such a such, such a great distiller? Uh, I think it's I think it's twofold, really. I think I think well, maybe even threefold. I think it's his brewing heritage is. Mm such an important thing in the distilling which I've said I think also it's a bit nerdy to be honest with you and that's why it just is really really into into the maybe not so much into whiskey as such as in the process it's it's more the process that he absolutely loves and and also I think the fact that he's he's given so much freedom as well I think that's the thing as well he's just he's, he's left to his own devices in a lot of ways and he's it's just a allowed to play, really. I think that's a, a lot of it. But I just think it's his, his interest in the entire process of everything. And mm. just say, and it's quite passionate with like Yesterday, for instance, we actually filled some uh, sherry casks. And uh, I'm, I'm based at home at the moment, obviously, with, uh, with all this. But just to have him ringing me up and saying, oh, my God, them casks. I've just, I've just smelt them just before, I, just before I filled them. And they are absolutely, well, he said pucker. They are absolutely <laughs> pucker of them, of them casks, and there were these sherry butts that we were filling, and uh, and just just for him to just want to pick the phone up and tell somebody just <laughs> about the smell of some casks before he's filled them, I think is just unbelievable, really. I'm always impressed when I go to distilleries, or there's a few distillers that I know, and you know maybe I've been there when a when a delivery has come in of casks, and I'm always amazed at, at the skill of. You know, within a few seconds, these distillers know exactly what they want, what they don't want, what's going back. What they just just with one look, you know, and, and the nose in the cask, and and that's it. And I'm that's incredible skill, and I love to see that someone like that working on their processes. It's it's amazing. Um, now, of course, you guys. Now, I know me and David do quite a bit together. Yeah, Sorry, I was going to say. I know me and David do quite a bit together with the actual development of the of the products that we bring out. And there's been a few times I've got my opinions. Uh, but obviously from more from a sales point of view and a, and then just an enthusiast point of view and david's yeah. got his but that's based up with distilling and and his knowledge and that sort of thing and uh, there's a few times when we've been getting some samples in the in the warehouses and just to see what works with what and a couple of times i've gone 
oh, I think if you put these two, we've tried them separately and that's really nice and that's really nice, put them together, they're going to be brilliant. And David's going, they're not. They're, this is what's going to happen if you put them together. And I'm going, no, I, it really isn't. I, I think that's what, put them together, yeah, he's right. That's exactly what's going to happen. It's either not a good thing or it's a really good thing or whatever, but it just, it's just, I don't know, it just seems to know. Uh, how things are going to work and what's going to work. Whether he's been around and tried every cask and done everything with him, I don't know, but he's, uh, oh. he's, he's very, very good at his job anyway, I must admit. Well, I've only, um, I've only chatted to him a couple of times at whiskey shows. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I think Whiskey Live and, and the, the Whiskey Exchange, I've had a couple of words with him, you know, mm. just about some things from there. But at some point, I'd love to come and meet him and do a proper um, interview as well. It'd be great to come and see his, his process, if he's, if he's open to that kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah, I know absolutely. some people like to be left alone. He, he, never, you know, he um, never wants <laughs> to. Uh, he never wants to. He's very re reticent to do anything like that. But then the second yeah. you get him going, uh, you can't shut him up. Uh, it's a little bit like that. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, now you guys, of course, you know, being the, the real pioneers and the founders of, of it, or the you know, the guys that restarted English whiskey production, you're the only guys that are sitting on stocks that are now approaching sort of the 15 year mark. So you must be up to what? So 2006, you must be up to 14 years. See some of your we're casks 14, now. Yeah, we're up to 14 years now. But obviously, you only start with one cask, don't you? So, uh, so really, because this last year in April, we brought out at April Maytan, we brought out our 11 year old, which was, which was that one there. The, uh, I, I did a little review of that one and I absolutely loved that. I thought I, it, that was, that's definitely in one of my top English whiskey releases this year. I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's really, really good. It was, it was mm. very, um, very appley and like stewed fruits stewed, and, stewed um, apples and that yeah it just yeah. straight away on the nose wasn't it it was just mm. it was it was a beautiful whiskey and yeah when i so, so i didn't mean to i, I was just getting enthusiastic about that whiskey there because it, it was a great no, right. no it is. it's really really good there's been so many uh good comments on it when we released it we would sort of thought it would be i don't know it would see us over christmas and yeah. hopefully and uh it didn't it didn't see us out of may to be honest so, <laughs> it's, uh, so it's it's done it's done really really well and it's something that we're possibly we will continue next year and yeah. and do it again but uh what i was coming to with that is that that's 11 years old and when we brought that out we've been going about 13 and a half years and yeah. you've got to have that there's always a lag between what you're releasing age wise and what you what what your age of your distillery is and i think that's just really because you need to have that consistency of stock and you need to have a bit of a stock build up to be able to get that consistency of stock really so okay bringing out a, a 13 14 year old single cask now because yes we have got casks of 13 14, but to be able to vat some together and make make a product that where there's five thousand bottles or something like that you've got to have that consistency of stock really Absolutely. And, and so, yeah, I'm, I've been very impressed and so have a lot of other people. You know, there's, there's many people that have, have been buying English whiskey company product or oh, bottlings for, for a long time um, and been consistent fans of, of the releases. But now it seems with some of these aged expressions, there's a whole new world that's opening up, you know, to uh, the English whiskey company. And it, it's and, uh, one I was blown. I really love this one. You know, the, um, the virtual festival a couple of weeks back. Yeah released the peter mm -hmm. cask you know for me that was that was beautiful it, it kind of took me back almost to like bunahaven to a kind of the warehouse number nine tasting idea it was yeah, this, yeah this is this was a beautiful one as well so it's really interesting to see these these age really age expressions coming out um through your time with the um the english whiskey company how have you seen um, the changes in perception of English whiskey? So I'm sure, you know, if your career with, with English and, and, and your career in general through the drinks industry, if you went back, say, 10, 15 years and you had, you'd had a conversation with someone about English whiskey um, compared to how they talk about the same subject now, how do you think perceptions and um, impressions of English whiskey has changed over that time? I think it's, I think it's changed, definitely. Uh, but I think it's changed quite quickly over the last few years. So mm -hmm. I've only I've only actually been employed by the English whiskey company, working direct with them now for about three and a half years. But I've been involved with English Whiskey Co. for since its inception, really, and that's because I worked for a lot of years for a company called Gordon and MacPhail up in Scotland, okay. and we were the UK distributor of English Whiskey Co. products when they first came out. So I was I've been selling English whiskey for right from right from when it came right from chapter six, really, and. When it first started, you're banging a lone drum. You're, you're, you're one voice in 
in the world banging a lone drum about English whiskey. And it was like pushing water uphill. But <laughs> only in the UK. Only in the UK. And oh, once you leave, once you leave and yeah. you go out to Scandinavia or to mainland Europe or the Far East, it's not it's not a it, it's not an obstacle and never has been an obstacle. They're so open to other things and so and just exploring and that sort of thing. Whereas in the UK, Scotland, we don't sell very well in Scotland, funnily enough, and never have done. And <laughs> I don't, and but in England, I always think I think it's only over, and not just with whiskey, with quite a lot of other things as well. I think it's only over the last say five or six years that we've sort of looked more inward on products that come from England and not outward like we always have done. So somebody would be very much up for American whiskey, but oh god, no, not English with English whiskey, that's not right, sort of thing. Mm. But now over the last couple of couple of three years, it's really gathered a lot of momentum. And a lot of that is that now there is 20 odd distilleries that are shouting about it or there's a good two or three that are really shouting about it and yeah. I think that's just as us all well when you are a lone bottle of English whiskey on a shelf yeah. it, it's, yeah. it's, 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 hard, it's a hard sell when there's a, a sector of English whiskey on a shelf it's yeah. a lot easier sell in that respect and hopefully we all rise on that tide sort of thing really absolutely well i think it, it a lot of the guys that are coming up now and releasing their first whiskies i'm sure and, and most of them i have talked to of course are, are very <laughs> you know they acknowledge the all of the work that you guys did you know as you say as a, as a lone voice for, for many years that's made it a lot easier for them to, to follow on the back of that and, and of course and it seems as well we're in a very it good should, position should to... sort of pay as a surcharge shouldn't they really yeah, I think. yeah. <laughs> you know I, i've been watching a lot of um uh, re through this lockdown and things like that I I've been watching a lot more TV than I usually do and had more time on my hands and I've been watching a lot of things like Narcos and um, you know things about Pablo Escobar and something like when you know, they're, they're charging a little license a, a little um, fee to put put things through their territory and so yeah so yeah, <laughs> as, exactly. as the godfathers of English whiskey you know should be uh... <laughs> yeah I think we'd rather be Cali Cartel than, than Pablo Escobar to be honest with you I think. yeah oh, he's a bit he's a bit wild doesn't he the Cali yeah. Cartel <laughs> seem to have things a little bit more organised you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> now um now excuse me <clears throat> clear my throat there now did when you talking about being a lone voice did you did you were there sort of different tactics that you had to employ in the early days especially around uh, you know, festivals in england or in scotland did you have to do a little bit of blind tasting for example to try and yes. get that perception you know of of on the this blind tastings were festivals. always <clears throat> yeah, blind tastings were always really, really good. And uh, it's, it's yeah. always something, we still do it now, to be honest with you. Uh, but yeah. it was always good when you were doing some Scotch whiskies or world whiskies or whatever it was. And then you throw in a mystery dram or a couple of mystery drams. And then you come to the yeah. end and you've got 30 or 40 people and you go, right, uh, what did you think of this one? The mystery dram. Oh, that was lovely. And oh, that, oh, that was my favourite. And then back then you turn it around and go, right, this was English whiskey. Ooh, actually, no, you could tell it was young, but they hadn't <laughs> told it was young a few about, about 10 minutes earlier as well. And I think one of the things that uh, that plays plays into that quite well is that a few, probably about, I think about, about two years ago, uh, Caden Heads, uh, independent yeah. bottlers, they did mm. a an, an independent bottling of ours. So they've done a few actually. And it was a, it was a peated eight year old. And mm -hmm. when they bring them bottlings out, um, them batches out, There'll be about seven or eight different whiskies in that batch and they have a tasting down in the London store. And, but it's a blind tasting, but everybody knows what they're tasting, but not in what order. And okay. along with ours, our eight-year-old, they also had a 28-year-old Ardbeg. And apparently the majority of people put ours down as the 28-year-old Ardbeg, which was like right. four or five times more expensive than ours yeah. as well, which yeah. I just think was, uh, was absolutely fantastic. I, I'm a big fan of blind tastings. I've I've done uh, in a few like the whiskey club that I'm involved in. I've done a few, and I, I and I did one that was um, kind of deliberately going after. Um, it was kind of pitching some premium price bracket whiskies alongside some supermarket brand or ones like that, you know. And it was amazing. There were some like little and Aldi kind of Isla whiskies that were, were kind of people thought they were the more expensive ones and you know and when you say well this one's 16 quid and this one's you know 75 quid or <laughs> it was it's quite amazing so I'm, because there is there's definite i think there is a bias you know when you see something that okay that's a scotch whiskey that's a 20 year old scotch whiskey of course that's got to be better than that you know 
10 year old English whiskey, you know, and if people don't know that and they just go by taste alone and, and, and smell and taste alone, mm. it's, it's let, let the palate be the judge, which is. There's so great. much bias, that, there's so much bias that your brain puts in front of you yeah. straight away that Absolutely. how it looks, whether it looks as though it's in a cheap bottle, whether it's from this place or whether it's from that place, the age, yeah. and yeah. just to have a proper blind tasting, I think brilliant. Yeah. I think and also you can kind of sometimes be talked out of your own opinions. So I've had that before where, where you take when I was, you know, just getting into whiskey a bit more seriously and there was something I really liked. And you've got someone who, you know, thinks they're a great whiskey expert and tells you, well, you shouldn't really like that because this is this, this and this. And then they start to tell you about certain things like, oh, yeah, I can I can kind of taste that now. And, yeah, and, and, you know, you can have other people's opinions can really kind of blind you. You know, there's lots nowadays. I'm very honest about the stuff that I like and that I don't like, you know, and it's um, it's great just based on my own personal taste. Um, I think you've I think you've got to be honest to yourself in that respect. And I think I've always been quite uh, I don't know, bullish at tastings and quite I've, I've always tried to chuck in marzipan because I've never tasted marzipan really in a whiskey, but I love to say, oh, is anybody getting marzipan? And then, oh yeah, I'm getting marzipan and I'm getting marzipan. <laughs> and I think, okay, it's, okay. well, there's nothing wrong at all with whiskey flavored whiskey. That's the thing. <laughs> and you, there's, you either like it or you don't like it. And that's it. Really. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I, I've had ones that I've been raving about and I've, I've given them to friends and they've almost spat them in my face, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, mm. that I've really liked. And it's that, that's, that's also the great thing I like about whiskey is there are so many out there and they're for all different palettes. And, and it could be, you know, it could be a, you know, like yourselves, English Whiskey Co. making one bottling that, you know, one person absolutely loves. It's their favourite. And then another person might much prefer your rise or much. And, and that's the great thing. It's yeah. um, I, I'm definitely not a there's only one best whiskey kind of person. You know, it's, it, it, there's so many. Um, now, so obviously, as you say, you've seen the perceptions have changed a great deal over the um, o over the years with uh, with English whiskey. How do you think that we can now protect that? Um, this, this is something that, um, you know, in a lot of the conversations I've had with distillers and people within the industry um, is now English whiskey is here. It's established. It's not going anywhere. And if anything, it's going to be increased and there's going to be more and more distilleries. What do we do to define an English whiskey? And what do we do to protect the quality of an English whiskey so there's not a load of other people popping up that are kind of not got the... I suppose it, whiskey is a very difficult thing to make cheaply you don't go into making whiskey to as a to make a quick buck um so of course that's you know that's the, that's one key thing but how do we protect the overall image the overall quality do we how are we going to define a category how are we going to what's the english whiskeys as the kind of you know the godfathers of english whiskey what's your um thoughts on that as as, as regards quality well i think it? i think we've uh, we've always tried to follow in some loosely follow the scotch whiskey regulations because they're there for a reason and yeah. the, 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 they're, they're there more for the quality than anything else. I think the way that the Scotch Whiskey Association is nowadays and how it's built, that's to, people think that's been around for hundreds of years. It hasn't. It's only been around maybe mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years or something like that. But yeah. they, uh, it's, I think they're quite restrictive in what they do now. The, the, the way that they put so many rules in on, on whether it be... Uh, or what sort of casks you can use and that sort of thing. I think I think they've they've stifled quite a bit of innovation in in for want of a better word really. I think yeah. for English whiskey, I think it's quite you've just got to be quite simple. And I think it's uh, it's got to be a minimum of three years in in wood, definitely. Yeah. And it's got to have been matured in England, really. And it's got to it's got to be malted barley and and that's it really that's all you really need to be honest with you mm -hmm. i don't think you should go lower than three years i don't think no. you should because then you're not making whiskey really whiskey whiskey is a defined thing and it's and it has it was been defined whether it's scotch whiskey or english whiskey or what it's a defined thing and i think that it should be three years and i think what the three-year thing does is it really it means you have to invest in it and i don't just mean money you have to invest time and mm -hmm. as opposed to it stops the, the sort of people bringing out anything that's, that's a quick book, like you said earlier mm -hmm. on, really. And, mm -hmm. and also, I think you've got to find some sort of way where it can be nice and simple, but it, it really protects the quality. because It's got to be mm -hmm. quality. We're all, luckily at the moment, we're all quite small and we're all doing it, I think, for the right reasons. There's a lot of passion in it from all the distilleries. 
And so everyone's doing the quality thing. It's not about driving turnover and driving money so much at the moment. At yeah. some point, somebody might come into the market that wants to do that. And you've got to be able to maintain the quality because once you're English whiskey, everybody's going to be tainted with the same brush. Yeah. And so, there's, so you've got to have you've got to have that in it. But I think it's got to be quite simple. And then, as I say, if you want to do something that's with a younger spirit, then call it something else at the end of the yeah. day. Call, call it spirit drink X or whatever it might be. I think and a few people have also said that maybe one, you know, exactly what you said there um, in terms of the, the specifications, but maybe also um, English barley, you know, maybe English barley is or English grain uh, used in the whiskey. Is that something that um, you think is a sensible one or is that not too? too no, well, I think, I think there's, there's, there's sense in that, obviously. Uh, but again, I don't think I don't think it's 100 uh, percent. It has to be 100 percent, really. We use barley from our own farms but only a percentage of it but the rest of it comes from the local area so we're doing that really yeah. but we're not tied to having to do that uh, so, so i think we, we do it out of that that's what we want to do and that's where we see ourselves being based but another company might want to try some fancy rye from czechoslovakia or something like that and you've got to think scotland the majority of their barley comes from other places but scotland at the end of the day yeah, really yeah, no yeah, there's absolutely. people see the things like uh, Isle barley were from uh from brocladi or from kilherman and that is yeah. just a tiny tiny amount of of what is it the, the physically is not enough square square feet on the yeah. on, on the island to grow that amount of barley for them and so i think i think it's something that it, it's an individual brand has to look at that an individual distillery has to make that decision on their own back really yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, it'd be, it'd be great in the future to see, you know, some kind of conference or get together of as many distilleries as possible. And uh, mm. in my personal opinion, I think it'd be great for them all to come down to Norfolk and uh, they're kind of they're where it all started and have a bit of a conference, exactly. you know, all the distilleries yeah. and in out of respect for, for where it all began and um, to, to kind of come together and see if there is, you know, a, a way to define sort of, you know guidance around what i think there should be an about. english whiskey day and it should be on james's birthday whenever that was i think it was in june well i'm all, I'm all for that that sounds uh yeah that, you have to get a little hashtag uh you know on, on yeah. all your social media things for that. <laughs> <laughs> that that sounds great great a uh, great idea i think um now of course we've got christmas you know not too far away um and you know you guys have got some you've had some great releases this year that i've thoroughly enjoyed um, you've got, of course, your your house, you know, the original and the smoky, which are great, great staples of, of what you offer, yep. which I also really enjoy. So have you got anything exciting that you're able to talk about coming out in the next few weeks for Christmas releases? Or is there anything you know, you're working on that you can tell us? <laughs> no, no, to be honest, uh, no, not really. Uh, if you think most of our releases, because we do an awful lot of export. And uh, yeah. so we're in around about 30 different countries out there. And that's all got to be on the water by now really uh, to be able yeah. to to get into market to be to be there for christmas so being a, a very odd year uh, for everybody <laughs> doesn't matter whether you're selling widgets or whether you're a civil servant or what it's just been an odd year hasn't it and uh, so we've actually done all the releases that we're going to be doing and uh, so there's they're still doing some bottlings and that sort of thing but there's nothing coming out right now we've uh, we've had our last one that we brought out was a wine cask which came out a few weeks ago and oh, yeah. was it a was it um Cabernet Cabernet Sauvignon? Sauvignon. Mm. yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I'm, I'm yet to try that that's 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 on my list that's definitely i've heard some great things about it actually from a few people mm. so yeah that's 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 next on my so, list <laughs> so that was that was a few weeks ago and just shortly before that we brought a uh, a gently smoked sherry cask out which uh, mm. you'll have to have a look at which is it's, that sounds good it's that one and it's that's absolutely fantastic it's got it's like dusty books and that sort of thing oh, okay. and it's got really really nice so it's, it's i think it was about 26 ppm something like that okay so nice not bit, massively yeah, yeah. in there just sits subtly in the background and it's got, nice and but it's got really really heavy hit in there it's absolutely gorgeous is that that sounds that sounds a perfect christmas dram that one that sounds very nice yeah, that sounds excellent and um, and talking of that kind of thing, you know, let's just say, you know, one last uh, one last question for you, uh, Mike. 
you know, let's say you have to um, flee your house in the next uh, five seconds. Uh, which bottle of uh, whiskey are you going to grab from behind you there? I'll your, just tip uh, it all into a big bucket, to be honest <laughs> with you. I think, that would be, I think this one, I've got, I've got quite a few of these, uh, which I bought years and years ago, which is the chapter 13 we did, if you can see oh, okay. that. Yeah, but yeah. I always call it the smudgy label one. And uh, <laughs> it's, I absolutely love it. And I've got, I can say quite, I've got a couple, one that's open and then I've got about four or five. It's no longer available, but okay. it was, I, tell you, you know, I always get like, it's like bread and butter on it. And I don't mean like lovely granary bread. I mean like Walburton's sliced <laughs> white and, and butter. And it's just, it's just such a lovely, lovely vanilla-y, vanilla-y dram. I absolutely love it. And so that, well, that was one we released. Well, released before I worked for the company, so I actually. And so that shows that I must like it because I actually bought them outside of working for the company, <laughs> and uh, I, I bought. I think I bought about eight or ten at the time, uh, just oh, nice. one after another after another because I knew it was going to run out. And now we haven't even got a bottle at the distillery of it now, uh, even oh, in our really? archive. So, so I've got it Did here. You- do you ever go back to David and say, you know, whatever you did here, can, can you do it again? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's been that a couple of times, to be honest. We've done that a couple of times and we've got some things possibly coming up next year, which uh, a bit of a heart back to something that we once did. And uh, we've, we've just a little bit more maturity to it and uh, it'll hopefully be, be very, very well received. Fantastic. Well, I um I better let you get back to you. I'm sure you've got some things that you need to do this afternoon. Yeah, but um, it's, it's a Friday afternoon, and and um I thank you. It's a, a great way for me to start the weekend having a chat with you. And um, now all of this chat about English whiskey, I'm I'm very tempted to uh, open this one tonight. Actually, it's uh, <laughs> I will get amongst it definitely. It's, well, I've, I've had some uh, some samples of it and absolutely loved it. And straight away, as soon as I you know I had to I had to go and get it. So it's it, for me, it was one of those. Um, it was just like you say, you know, you, you, there's one that you go to and you think this is really great. So you immediately attach to it. And this was one of those for me. And I don't know. I, I looked on your website. I don't even think this is available now. I think this is this is gone as far as I can see. No, um, I don't think it's all gone. I think there's two or three bottles in the actual physical shop. And oh. but that's about it, I think. Because yeah, I, I found it so like there's a lot of toffee, a lot of dark sugar on there as well, as well as the peated. And, and it was mm. yeah, lovely. So. This is this is maybe my my go-to at the moment for from English Whiskey Co. But Mike, thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, okay. and, no, uh, thank for, you for chatting about the English Whiskey Company and um, and as I say, of course, everyone that's interested in English whiskey, um, really the starting point should be to go and check you guys out because um, it's where it all started. Yeah, so uh, thanks to you guys for all of that, and um, I look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Mm-hmm.